The title of our sermon is More Than Conquerors of Ourselves. The text that I'll read in a few minutes is from Paul's letter to the church at Rome, or the church is at Rome. And if to hear the text is to think that the fear is of what is on the outside and that God's protection is from what is on the outside beyond ourselves. But the reality is that as Franklin Delano Roosevelt said at the beginning of World War II, that the greatest fear is, is fear itself. And it's how do we deal with the fears of ourselves being adequate or inadequate, the fears of how we will respond, the fears of whether we'll be up to the task, the fears of how others will see us, these are far greater than the fears of anything that comes from without. So we'll talk about that uh, in a few minutes. Let's pray. Our dear and gracious God, we thank you for moving us together and moving us together in a solidarity of love in a solidarity of justice, in a solidarity of determination to stand and stand lovingly in the face of all that comes. In Jesus' name and for his kingdom's sake, amen. The circus had come to town. Those traveling circuses that you see set up in various shopping centers, they stay for a weekend or two before bundling up and moving on to the next city. In the particular city, the president of the board of the circus walked into the Three Ring Circus tent with a new board member who lived locally. This was this board member's first chance to actually see the circus in person. And so as they stood there beholding all of the rehearsal that was going on during the day in anticipation of the show that night, the, the president asked the board member, have you ever seen this show before? And the board member said, oh, many times, but it's all been online because the show's been touring around the United States. This is the first time that it's, it's come to our town. And he said, well, what do you think of the acts? And he goes, oh, I think they're fabulous. I mean, you've got the clowns in the car, you've got the jugglers, you've got the trapeze artists. And the president said, well, have you seen the high wire artist? And he said, sure, yeah, he's up there right now. And there was the high wire artist, high wire, inch and a half wide, strung from one pole, 90 feet from another pole, 90 feet up in the air. And he was, had his wheelbarrow and he was one foot in front of the other, moving the wheelbarrow across the span. And the president asked, he said, you've seen that before? He said, yeah, but it's really something to see it in person. I'm looking forward to bringing my, my family here tonight. And he said, well, you got confidence in what he's doing. He said, oh my gosh, he's done this dozens of times, sure. He said, so you don't think there'll be any trouble tonight with him walking that wheelbarrow across the wire? Absolutely not, said the new member. And the president said, good, because you're gonna be sitting in the wheelbarrow tonight. <laughs> I think that if we are honest, We enjoy a comfortable Christianity. And by that, I mean a Christianity, a practice of faith where we are largely in control individually. Control, that word, that power is very important to us Christians, especially here in the Western world. So is individuality. I can do it myself and I will do it by myself. We like and we protect our individuality and the perceived power and comfort that that gives us. A sin that goes all the way back to Eve, Adam, and Moses who sought individuality apart from God and apart from God's people. And they sought a comfort in that when really it was simply standing in the shadows of an illusion 
that they wanted to cling to, not in the light that properly belonged only to God. No, in our comfortable Christianity, it is usually not until we find ourselves in a circumstance or an event not of our own doing or control that we discover just how strong our faith is or isn't. We find it far easier to talk about fear and uncertainty and risk when it involves others. But when we unexpectedly find ourselves on the high wire, in a wheelbarrow, and out of all modicum of control and comfort, we are forced to ask, is my faith adequate to the task, to the fear in front of me? How adequate then is my comfortable, controlling faith? How's it holding up for me and for all of those who see me exposed in the spotlight with all of the uncertainty and fear that we truly feel crying out to God in our panic, Abba, Daddy, Father. If you can picture a moment like that in your mind, if you can feel in your heart a moment like that in your life, then you can better hear the words of Paul who spoke for himself, but also spoke for the believers to whom he was writing in the churches in Rome, who daily lived a beleaguered life of uncertainty and fear, especially since they were calling someone other than Caesar their Lord, their Savior, their Master, their King. They lived in a place where there were few places to hide that fear. Listen for Paul's words to them. In the same way, the Spirit comes to help our weakness. We don't know what we should pray, but the Spirit himself pleads our case with unexpressed groans. The one who searches our hearts knows how the Spirit thinks because he pleads for the saints, that is to say, all the believers, consistent with God's will. We know that God works all things together for good for the ones who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. We know this because God knew them in advance, and he decided to, in advance that they would be conformed to the image of his Son. That way the Son would be the first of many brothers and sisters. Those who God decided in advance would be conformed to his Son, he also called. Those whom he called, he also made righteous, and those whom he made righteous, he also glorified. So, what are we going to say about these things? If God is for us, who's against us? He didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Won't he also freely give us all things with him? Who will bring a charge against God's elect people? It is God who acquits them. Who's going to convict them? It's Jesus Christ who died even more, who was raised and who also is at God's right side. It's Christ Jesus who also pleads our case for us. Who will separate us from God's love? Will we be separated by trouble or distress or harassment or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, as it's written, we're being put to death all day long for your sake. We're treated like sheep for slaughter. But in all these things, we win a sweeping victory through the one who loved us. I am convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Not death or life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor present things or future things, not powers or height or depth or anything else that is created. The fact of the matter is that our comfortable Christianity 
that in that Christianity we want to feel and practice and project on our terms that which is finally an illusion, like power and control, an illusion. The reality is that individually and collectively as the church, we are all on that high wire, in the wheelbarrow, wondering what we will do with the uncertainty and the fear that we feel. Last Sunday's firebombing next door made that real for us. So hear the good news. It's God's wheelbarrow. This is not a text and much less a proof in a text of predestination. It is a beautiful and intimate description of sanctification, of God working in our lives through and in spite of the uncertainty and fear in our lives as members of Christ's body, the church. Verse 28 does not say that God wills all things, but that God works in all things for the good of those who love God and are called to God's purposes. You are those. You at home are those. You who feel you or your church are on a tightrope 90 feet off the ground, you are those who love God and are called to God's purposes. Of course there's groaning. Of course there's moaning and there's gasping and there's grasping for answers. Rejoice! You are right where God's glory will be revealed in ways that our nearsightedness simply cannot see, much less control. We cannot sit in the wheelbarrow and push it at the same time. God forces upon us who choose an attitude of trust. Fortunately, we don't have to control that wheelbarrow. God didn't give that to us to do. As Paul says, the whole creation waits breathlessly with anticipation to see what God will do with God's sons and daughters. That means us collectively as the church. And in the meantime, the Spirit of God comes to us to help us in our weakness, in our powerlessness, in the wheelbarrow pleading our case, praying our case with sighs and groans too deep for words. We can trust that. It is not just on us. It is not just on our church or our friends next door. We all are yoked to Jesus. And what did Jesus say about his yoke that he shares with us? It eases the strain and makes the load lighter for everyone. We can trust that. As you've heard, an explosive device was placed at the front door of our neighbors next door. Unfortunately, no one was injured. It is only glass and frame and facade that need to now be repaired. Several of our members, including those who share a plot in the community garden that delivers hundreds of pounds of vegetables and fruit to the local food pantry for those who do not get to enjoy that luxury very often. These have reached out to our neighbors next door with support of whatever they need, including labor, to replace the damage done. Dr. Aya, their new pastor, thanked me and thanked our church for our care, our prayers, our solidarity. As is true within our churches, so it is true between our churches. We are better together. We are stronger together. And we will stand side by side going forward. 
when we stand for the good, when we stand for the right, when we stand for the just, we stand in the crosshairs of those who stand for something less. So, as I wrote in the Dallas Morning News, it is upon us as residents and persons of faith to remain diligent, prayerful, and in solidarity with one another in our stance of love against hate in all of its forms. Recently, there have been four people who have inspired me in that stance, that stance of unconditional and determined love, regardless of the circumstance. Mary Lynn Merle, Jan Samuels, Norm Stevens, and Doug Hermance. You don't know Doug. I married Doug to a dear high school friend of mine 24 years ago. This last Thursday, I buried him in Houston at age 65 after a two-year battle with brain cancer. What for me marked in common these four saints was an otherworldly sense of contentment, regardless of what was going on around them, regardless of their personal medical circumstance that at times was both painful and so very frustrating because doctors were helpless to do anything about it. And yet, they had a serenity about them that knew that their medical condition was not their final horizon. And they were content with that. They lived, as I said about Doug this last Thursday, what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4 is he wrote to that church in its uncertainty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul echoes that sentiment in this, probably his last letter, when he says now to the churches in Rome, also living in their circumstance of uncertainty and some fear, who then will separate us from Christ's love? Will we be separated by trouble or distress or harassment, famine, nakedness, danger, sword? As it's written, we're being put to death all day long for your sake. We're treated like sheep for slaughter. But in all these things, we win. We win a sweeping victory through the one who loved us. I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not death or life, angels or rulers, not present things or future things, not powers or height or depth or any other thing that is created. That's it. That's the secret sauce. That's our superpower. That's our comfort. That's how we grow in Christ, how we are sanctified, how we are made holy. We live boldly a Christianity that is not comfortable. We live it individually, we live it collectively, 90 feet in the air, in a wheelbarrow, on a wire, trusting to get across. What steadies us, what moves us, what comforts us, what saves us is the one whose hands are on the wheelbarrow. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>